your own personality, and the audience. Use entertaining material as a means of conveying a serious message. This will be a five to seven minute speech. Iqbal intends to deliver a serious message about American greed that is threatening the American dream. He will try to, to mix the serious message with some lighter comments in the hopes that this message is absorbed by the audience. The title of his speech is When the Bubble Bursts, and he is a size 13. Please welcome Iqbal. My fellow Toastmasters and my dear valued guests, when the bubble bursts, Growing up as children, the only bubble that we knew of was a bubble gum. We blew air into it, so much so that it couldn't take it anymore. Then it would blow up on our face, and it would look like this. And it would go all over your face. And then of course you'll take it back, put it back in your, in your mouth, and start chewing it again. You keep doing it with no shame, no regret. Even if somebody's looking, hopefully that your nose is clean. That was the bubble we knew of. But now that we are grown up, we have heard about different kinds of bubbles. We have heard about stock market bubble. We have heard about dot com bubble. And we have heard about our most favorite, the real estate bubble. So now, when the real estate bubble bursts, it looks like this. As adults and professionals, we understand that. But when a dot-com bubble bursts, it looks like this. <laughs> you must be wondering, what's this? Does anybody understand? Yeah. Alright, I think John understands. For everybody else's purposes, this is a very expensive Audi, and it's actually parked at the airport. Somebody just left it. They bought a one-way ticket to whichever country that came from. I actually saw it with my own eyes, because I was in Silicon Valley from 2000 to 2005, when the dot-com bubble happened. So people had this fake money, this paper money that they made, and now at the end of the year, they had to pay alternative minimum tax to Uncle Sam for the money they never even took home. That was one case, and there were other cases, of course. We know that they get some equity and they start using it before even they get the cash. So that's what happened. When they had to pay alternative minimum tax on the money they never made, they couldn't afford these cars anymore. They couldn't afford to pay Uncle Sam as well. So they left their cars at the airport, parked as is, and bought one-way tickets. So that was one sign of the dot-com burst. So now, our favorite, the real estate bubble. When it bursts, it looks like this. None of us want to see this in our neighborhood. That's how the real estate bubble looks like. Now, why does this happen? I think it's purely because of American greed. We are greedy. We want to become rich very quickly without doing much effort. And then there's a joke about this as well. But a devil tells a businessman that I can make you rich, I can make you famous, I can make you the most demand, in demand person in the whole universe. The businessman responds, what do I need to do um, in return? The devil says, nothing, you just need to give me your soul. <laughs> soul of your children, the soul of your parents, soul of your great-grandparents, and the soul of all your descendants throughout eternity. You know the businessman response? He says, what's the catch? <laughs> so, what do we need to do? We need to, of course, adjust our expectations. The homes that we used to buy, originally they were there for us to live. They were not there, there to, for us to gain 5 to 10 percent and sell them. That was not the purpose of the homes then. We need to adjust ourselves according to our financial situation. What was home before? The home was to keep up, uh, we had a roof on, our, our, on top of our heads. It was there to keep the rain out. We had four walls to keep 
the wind out. We had the floor to keep the cold out. The home was much more than that. It was the loss of the baby. It was the song of the mother. It was the strength of the father. It was warmth of the living hearts. That was home. The home was not for sale. We have changed. We need to adjust our expectations about what home was. So what are our lessons learned from, from all of this that we see when we see the real estate bubble? Or any bubble for what, uh, no matter what. lessons that we must learn that we can never time the market you can never sell a house at the topmost price and you can never buy a house at the lowest possible price obviously you can try your luck jumping off a train or on a train in some cases your home is not your piggy bank this is not for, for you to, to use. When you get some equity, you start using that equity. It's not for that purposes. It's not for consolidating all the debts that you have. And then, of course, you've heard about the joke where he says that you have consolidated all the debt. Now there will be only one bill that you can't pay. <laughs> we don't want to be in that situation because home is for you to live forever and for you to pass on to your generations. That's how the home used to be, and that's where we need to go. And yes, if something is too good to be true, then it probably is. It's a utopia. <coughs> My friends, in order to summarize, home is for us to cherish. There are certain things that are not true. Paper money is not your money. It's not even cash in your hand. In the past, people saved money, 10%. Saving and then you, you would spend money. Nowadays, we spend money that we don't even have. Let's change that. Let's live in this world with realis real realism and make it a better world. And instead of those fake uh, lives that we are living beyond our means. I hope this helps. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. This is a very timely speech as well, because bubbles are created, especially the financial bubble, when people get their needs met at the expense of others. So they're, we're really concerned about our own needs. Hey, I need some comfort. I need to security. I need a home that's bigger than what I can afford. And so when we get our needs met at the expense of formulating this bubble, then that's when things start to fall apart. So. Thank you so much for that speech, and I'd like to invite our Table Topics Master, John Bowman. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. This is the portion of the meeting where we have some volunteers who come up and think on their feet for one to two minutes. So do I have any volunteers for the eight questions, one of the eight questions I have today? Kavita. Kavita, when someone comes to you with a problem, is it a good idea to give them advice? If someone comes to you with a problem, is it a good idea to give them advice? Thank you, Mr. Kavita. To me with a problem, uh, what would be a good idea to do? And the first thing I can think of is my two and a half year old son, because he's at an age where he has problems and problems and problems, and he's <laughs> small thing he does. And every time he comes to me saying, Mama, I cannot get to this, or I have a shopping cart and I cannot pull it out. And Having a two and a half year old son gives you a really good perspective of what you should do in this kind of situation because my first instinct as a mother is, oh, I can help you pull that out. Oh, I can help you with that. Instead of that, with time I've learned that 
to sit down with him and ask him, okay, you got stuck there. How did you get stuck there? What can you do to get yourself out of there? And I think those are the small things by interacting with him on a daily basis. I think he has gotten to learn that, yes, I got stuck in a problem, but probably there could be a way out that I don't need help from somebody else at all, any, at every point of time. And hopefully, if I keep doing this in my daily life, it will help people know that there are problems and if they come to me for, for advice, I help them so that they can help themselves in future. Thank you, Mr. Tirupati. Before we go to the next one, could you do me a favor and turn off the videoing since I forgot to do that before?